Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Elizabeth Nolan Brown, an associate editor for Reason.com. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Liz. Thanks for having me. What is sex trafficking? Uh, I mean, that depends, I guess, if you mean in in the popular, you know, conception or under the law, under the federal law. I mean, choose choose which one or maybe both. So, I mean, I think when people think sex trafficking, you know, they think uh, at the most extreme. But I think they tend to think towards the most extremes. They tend to think people that are being held physically, that are, you know, you know, either kept in a room or kept in bondage and, you know, that have been maybe abducted or tricked into it, that are being, you know, threatened, that are being... Uh, maybe physically abused, uh, shipped things in like shipping that. Shipping containers, right? Coming yes. over, you know, shipped in shipping containers, things like that. So, um, I think at very least, people think you know that there is some element of force or fraud being used in in you know when you talk about sex trafficking. But uh, under you know under the federal definition and under various um, state and city you know the way that they use it in in, in police departments and the media, it often. You know, in in the media and police, it could often just mean prostitution. They've just sort of started referring to all prostitution as sex trafficking. Under federal law, it means um, it's part of, you know, the general trafficking in person statute, which means there's two different kinds of, of, of human trafficking in persons. There's labor trafficking and there's sex trafficking. Um, for adults, there has to be an element of force, fraud, or coercion involved in order to to be sex trafficking. Uh, if someone is under 18, there does not have to be any force, fraud, or coercion involved. And there actually doesn't even have to be any sort of, you know, middleman or pimp or trafficker or madam or anything like that involved. Um, because, so wait, can you traffic yourself then? Well, you uh, – so no, but you can – Mostly not. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, under the Mann Act, you, you can actually, but that's something different. But um, no, but the the elements of, of the statute in which you can be a sex trafficker too is not just to sort of compel someone into prostitution or abduct or force or whatever. It's um, anyone who also promotes or advertises or solicits or patronizes. So customers of anyone who is under 18 could be charged as a sex trafficker. So, uh, you know, in a situation, say, like a 17-year-old, you know, puts an ad somewhere and, and meets up with someone and doesn't even say, you know, says they're, you know, 19, and uh, then that person could be charged with sex trafficking. Um, and it doesn't matter if, you know, there's the eight, not knowing the age is not a a defense. So there's a lot of difference between sort of um, what people think of as sex trafficking and what a lot of criminal justice, you know, the way it's used in criminal justice in America. Well, so that that ambiguity makes answering this next question more difficult. But roughly, do we have an idea of how much of this there is going on? Uh, no. But if you, you know, most of the numbers that you have out there from various uh, Nonprofit groups are very biased um, or from the federal government, at least the ones that they advertise, are, are very biased and are very inflated and have been debunked and discredited in various ways. Um, you know, even sometimes the federal government has, you know, said to stop using them, but they still are like wind their way through, you know, the Internet and everywhere and still get recycled again and again. Um, when it comes to the number of sex trafficking arrests and prosecutions in the United States, you can, um, you know, get get better numbers. Still not exactly, though, because it's it's still, um, you know, like I said, you know, the, the, there's a wider le- range of conduct. But we're talking about usually, you know, a couple hundred to a couple thousand in the United States prosecutions for sex trafficking every year. So um, under the under the broad scope of things. Why, why are the numbers biased? Oh, because I mean, there's a lot of people who one because it's a hard thing to measure, right? It's a you know, it's a both prostitution and and you know, forced sex trafficking are hard to measure because they're underground and it's very hard to get you know reliable populations to talk to, populations to talk to, reliable data. Um, but also, I mean, you have a lot of groups who are very invested for various reasons um, in sort of in conflating prostitution and sex trafficking. Um, so they're just anti-prostitution groups that have sort of moved into the yeah, sex trafficking. Yeah, either, either they're anti-prostitution groups for ideological reasons um, because they're, you know, certain kinds of feminists or, or religious groups, um, or there are groups that are 
realize that there's a lot of money in fighting sex trafficking. There's a, a ton of federal funding for both um, state and local law enforcement agencies and for nonprofits, small groups, social service agencies, whatever, uh, if they're fighting sex trafficking. So they have a lot of good reason to sort of inflate the the numbers of people that they're helping and the population out there that, that needs to be served, obviously, so that they can, you know, get more attention and get more money. And um, so they generally tend to either inflate, conflate all prostitution, all, all sex workers as sex trafficking victims, or just rely on really ridiculous methods. Um, you know, one of the most cited numbers is that there are 300,000 children either at risk of being trafficked in the United States every year or being trafficked every year. Um, it was from this one study from the early 2000s that the lead researcher has now been like, don't pay attention to it's it's terrible. Um, it was published in a non-peer-reviewed academic journal. And in order to determine who was at risk, they they tallied up these things that they decided made kids at risk of being sex trafficking, which included anything from being in a single family home to living in like uh, subsidized housing to having ever been in child the child protective services, to all sorts of things that and then they didn't even matter if people were in like a few of those categories, then they counted them each as separate. And then they added that whole number together and you know magnified about how many kids that would be and then said that was why there were 300,000 children. So um, it's just, there's just like a lot of bad methodology like that. Well, then given given that, do we have, so there is, you said that the, the hard numbers we have often include prostitution yeah. um, and things that don't fit our kind of common conception of what sex trafficking looks like. Do we then have any sense of how much of the, you know, the, the image of women basically sold into slavery or imported and kept confined or children pressed into prostitution against their will, like that kind of sex trafficking. Do we have any sense of how much of that there is? As far as hard data, no. Um, you know, what? but I – one thing I kind of I have so many Google alerts for all these different terms, and I've been you know for like three years now covering this and monitoring sort of all these and and for various features and research projects I've been doing actually digging into who gets arrested for this across the country. Um, I al almost never see cases like that, um, and there's some statements from you know various federal. Um, agents that give us some clues, like the former uh, John Pistole, he was the former director of the FBI, I think. He did a congressional testimony and talked about the underage victims they saw. He said only about 25 percent of them were forced at all. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they were, you know, yeah, tied up in cargo containers, but he said about 25 percent of the underage people working in prostitution that they encountered and counted among their, you know, underage child victim totals were people who had been, had some element of force involved in, in their being trafficked. It seems that the Either way, if this happens, it's a, it's a bad thing. I mean, the, the classic type that we're talking about, maybe for some oh, listeners right, right. who think prostitution is a bad thing too, or at least under some circumstances, if you're poor or have no other options or things like this. So shouldn't we have a fairly broad definition of this in order to combat it? I mean, what, what's really the problem with having a broad definition of sex trafficking in order to better combat it? Obviously, I think that there's nothing wrong with the, the definition for adults, the saying that force, fraud, or coercion, you know, involved is sex trafficking. Um, with the sort of, with the teen definition, uh, with, you know, with anything being involved, you end up with a, you end up with people who, you know, maybe they had a a lapse in judgment deciding to go meet a 16-year-old for sex. You know, maybe maybe they didn't even know. Who knows? But, like, you know, maybe maybe they did and they just, you know. But that doesn't seem like it should be a federal crime with, you know, a mandatory minimum sentence and a possible life in federal prison for that. And when we when we conflate it, that's what you're doing. A, you're, you're making everyone treated like the worst cases under the law. B, that— means that basically the FBI and all the federal law enforcement agencies and all the small town police departments only go after those people because that's really easy. And again, you know, they get they have a whole lot of incentives in order to, to report on how many sex trafficking arrests they made. There's these crazy reports that the D Department of Justice has to put out where the FBI has to put all these like different metrics like here's how many investigations we started, here's how many arrests we made, here's how many prosecutions. And they're they're they brag about how they increase their metrics this many, you know, from year to year, almost just like you're reporting on whatever, except they're, you know, arresting people and giving them federal prison sentences. And so it gives them a lot of incentives go after these because there's 
that's really easy. And because the kind of sex trafficking that is really horrible and the kind that we think of as sex trafficking is, is very rare and is not happening in every community. That's what they say. It's happening in every community. No, that is not happening in every community. What is happening in every community is prostitution, is sometimes underage people working in prostitution. And so, I mean, I'm not saying that we should, that that should be legal. I'm not saying we should, you know, let, you know, ever anyone just, you know, pay underage people for sex. I'm not saying that we shouldn't necessarily try to get them services, but the way we go about it now by just, you know, treating, we also treat them, we, we arrest them in order or in order to get them services. So it's just this, it's just creates all these really perverse law enforcement incentives and ends up, you know, making everyone worse off, people who are consensually in sex work and the people that do really need our help. Well, I think that's a good point to kind of get into this story uh, before we kind of get into broader things. Since a lot of our listeners may not be aware of how this works. And you, yeah. wrote, you wrote an excellent four-part piece on a on a bust in Seattle that was proclaimed as the largest sex trafficking bust in years, or I can't remember exactly what the headlines were. Um, and because if our listeners sit here being like, this woman is defending sex trafficking, or this woman doesn't care about this, um, how bad of problem is this? I think the story is a really good example of how this could happen. So maybe you can tell us what happened in Seattle. Yeah. Um, so this this is a case that was – it's actually still ongoing, but it started in January 2016, or that's when the first arrests were made. And, um, you know, they, the headlines from – first this is in Seattle and in Bellevue, just outside of Seattle, and the headlines uh, first in the local media and the TV stations and the local newspapers. And then it sort of spread to AP and Reuters and the New York Times and pretty much every major outlet and even, you know, the, across in the UK were covering it. Um, you know, that they had busted this league, this international league of sex traffickers. They're trafficking in Korean women to Seattle and also around the United States. They had a secret message board where they promoted their prostitution and raided them and, you know, talked about how to access uh, them. They had these, you know, high-end brothels where they were kept all day and couldn't leave and had to be there and service all these men all day. And uh, it was this, you know, it had taken months of work and they had, but finally the Seattle police and the King County Sheriff's Office working with federal law enforcement agents had penetrated this ring. And, uh, and, and that was what everyone reported. Um, that was sort of the story. So I, I you know, I, I covered it with a blog post like in January and was kind of skeptical, but there wasn't really much to go on. Um, other than the fact that the board that they were calling a sort of sex trafficking board was just a board where adult sex workers advertised. You mean a, a, a board is in a forum? Yeah, sorry, like a forum, like a message board, or a, you know, kind of like Reddit or whatever. Um, so and it's like so, Craigslist for sex traffickers kind of thing? Except it was not for sex traffickers. For, for it was for prostitution workers, and sex work more broadly. Um, and I actually, you know, it was a Seattle, spe- so first of all, it was not a, a, at all a, a international or whatever board. It was a Seattle specific or that area spe- region specific board. Um, you know, I know some sex workers out there in that community and they advertised on that board. So I, I, and I, I talked to them about it before. It was just a place where adult sex workers could post advertisements for themselves about, you know, here are my rich here are my hours, whatever. I mean, it was all a little bit coded because prostitution is still illegal. And But uh, then customers could look at their profiles, could figure out how to contact them. And then customers could also leave reviews and communicate in messages with each other. They could communicate in private messages with each other. They could review the, the women and say, you know, I saw this person and here's, you know, whatever. Um, the reviews were overwhelmingly positive, if graphic, because they did involve sex. But they weren't like... They, they they were typical things people would say about sex. Like not anything, if there were you know. prostitutes on Amazon, it'd be like the Amazon reviews. Yeah. Yes. So um, yeah. So it was. So it was definitely not a board that was that was primarily about sex trafficking. But you know, at first it was like, okay, well, I don't know. Maybe there were people who were being sex trafficked who were being advertised there, and and somehow they did they, they didn't know this. Were the were the women. Um, in this alleged sex trafficking ring, underage? No, no, they were all adults. They were all adults. And and so the the website was the was consider so the feds consider or the, I guess the local police and some of the feds considered this a massive uh, com- I mean because they were facilitating I can't remember what word you use for the statue but facilitating communicating it, it, so, all those things can make you a sex trafficker so now the whole board the whole forum is a sex trafficking ring yes which of course is not what you think of when you think of a sex trafficking ring but is statutorily 
I guess, true. Right. So they described so they described it as, you know, that there being this ring, this board, and then they said there were three there were three people, only three that got arrested on human trafficking charges. And or and then there were about twelve men that got arrested for promoting prostitution on this board. So uh, about six months later, I started, I was like, I wonder what happened with that case. And I started looking into it and I started looking at the court records. And it turned out that the three that they had, that they had described as the, the huge, that they had been charged with human trafficking, the huge leaders of this international ring, had both been quietly offered and taken plea deals months earlier uh, with no promotion by the police. I mean, and they had really promoted this when it happened. They had did all these press conferences and all this stuff. Didn't say anything at all in the media about how they gave plea deals to these people. And the plea deals for these, you know, alleged international human traffickers, one of them was for permitting prostitution, and two of them were promoting prostitution, which are both relatively minor charges. And uh, the one got off with no jail time, and I think the other one had, like, two months jail time, and the most was three months jail time, and then some community service and stuff, and that's all that they got. So that was suspicious, and it's like, okay, if that's what's, you know, what, why is this the case? Um, so basically, sorry, not, not to ramble on, but uh, what, once you look into it, it turned out basically what we had happening here was uh, a lot of Korean women who would come over um, of their own accord on with, you know, uh, from Korea in order to on student visas or on tourist visas. And then while they were here, you know, or uh, overstay their visas sometimes and end up working as sex workers because they could make a lot of money here and they could make it quickly and without people they know knowing about it and, and send money back to their families in Korea or and or just, you know, save up and go back home. And they could make so much more money here than they did there. Um, you know, there are there are uh, there's a huge trail of evidence of them writing and people writing about them that shows that they were not being held hostage, that they had traveled here of their own accord from different cities. They had flown here, you know, if that they they could come and go, they if they were being held, you know, they wouldn't be allowed any of these things that they were being allowed. Um, so. You know, the, the police said that maybe some of them were, were in debt bondage, that they had to pay off loan sharks back in, uh, you know, somewhere else. And um, I, I'm, I'm in debt bondage to the federal <laughs> student yeah. loan agencies. Well, so. yeah, I mean, they even said they're like some of them were being, you know, they had loans for credit cards. And it was like they had credit card debt. That's what we're saying was trafficking <laughs> them. I mean, and I, so and you can't we can't say for sure. And I don't want to say that none of these women maybe had someone somewhere back in Korea or something pulling some sort of shady strings. But there was nothing like a coordinated attempt to smuggle these people here or to keep them here under any sort of force or coercion. Um, it was basically just a lot of different women who were here for different reasons. And what they would do while they were here is they would come to Seattle for a few weeks and then they'd go to L.A. for a few weeks and they'd go to different places. And then if business was good, they'd come back and things like that. So the men would post post on this board and say, you know, hey, uh, they, you know, they all had these very Americanized, you know, uh, pseudonyms like Chloe. So Chloe's back in town, you know, she's at this uh, agency, this, you know, dream girl, K-Girls Delight. She's at that for two weeks. She'll be there, whatever. And they would post about it. Um, these agencies turned out it was people that the, it turns out the people who had been charged as the human traffickers originally who ended up getting off as permitting and promoting prostitution. They were people that kept apartments. Um, two of them were men who had been former sex work clients and were now prostitution clients and were now retired. One of them was dating a sex worker. Another one was a sex, a Korean sex worker herself. Um, she had an apartment and she rented out the spare bedroom. The two men kept a separate apartment in like a high end apartment building. And they would, you know, they would organize the things where they would, the girls would come in and they would take care of posting the ads for them, making the arrangements, screening clients, doing, making sure that they're like, no one got in and stuff. There were very strict rules. Um, people had to like give their real identification. They had to have people vouch for them. They had to shower once they got there and use mouthwash and all this stuff. It was like, it was a very safe operation because these men had been very well screened. They were in a very secure building. There was not, you know, nothing was bad was going to happen to these women in this situation. So, you know, say what you will about prostitution, even, but even if you don't support it, this was happening in the safest sort of way possible. So, um, you know, you had these people who had these apartments and, and they were ended up but those are like the dungeons to the to the right, to and that's that was what was being described as these brothels where where they were being held in captivity and, and things like that, and it just wasn't like that at all. And then ultimately, um, you know, the men who had written on the board got charged all with promoting prostitution, which is a felony. And uh, you mean promoting is an advertising it or saying prostitution is a good thing? Well, so traditionally, I mean, traditionally, <laughs> promoting prostitution has been a charge reserved for people like 
pimps or madams or whatever you want to call them, people who financially benefit from a prostitution business or from someone else's, you know, sex work. So that's how the charge has always been used. This is the first time there are some lawyers who are working on the case and, and they'd done a lot of constitutional work and they said this is the first time they'd heard of this happening like anywhere in the United States. But they used it to mean these people had written good reviews for these women online and since they had decided these women were being trafficked, then they were promoting the prostitution of these women by writing good reviews for them and therefore it was a felony. I mean, even if the women weren't being trafficked, it was still a felony because they had promoted the prostitution of anyone. But weren't they I, – I just remember from the article that they were benefiting financially because they were setting up these apartments and – but well, then in, in exchange, they were taking a cut. Well, OK. That's – so that's the, the men who – yeah, the, the two men who owned the apartments were. The majority of the men, the 12 men, the 12 other men that were arrested, and now there's been a whole new crop that's also been arrested for the same thing. The majority of those that were arrested were just people who posted to the board. Um, some of them would meet up about once a month at like a pub in town and like get beers and talk about things. And uh, But it wasn't like, you know, they, they weren't like... None of them had a fin- – only one of the men actually ran the board. None of them had a financial stake in the board. I mean these were just – some of them had never even met the other men. A lot of them were just people who had just posted to this board, hey, here's good things about this person. Go see them. So they're, they're pimps in the eyes of the law basically. Yeah. I mean, that's a really, that's a crazy sort of, it has a lot of First Amendment implications, obviously, because, you know, these are just people, and that was what a lot of them said, you know, that we were just, you know, we were just writing stories or whatever. Like, you, I mean, these, even if they were going to get someone for solicitation or pr- patronizing and prostitute charges, you would have to show that they had gone there and actually been there and actually offered money or at least, you know, showed up with the intent to do it, that they had the money or whatever in their pocket. Um, and, and in this case, they don't have to. They just have to say, you wrote about it. And they can say, well, I, it didn't actually happen because I was just making up that story. I, I didn't even see the person. And, and it, it doesn't matter because you wrote about it and you wrote a good thing. And so you're promoting their prostitution. Well, that's That was interesting in light of one of the kind of bizarre asides in the article or, or odd little facts in there was that one of the cops investigating it had spent like two years posting on these yes, things. There's a cop yeah. who was writing reviews of prostitutes. Yes. And someone someone got a, did a FOIA request and got uh, got them and posted them online. I forget now. It was like a local media outlet. But um, they, yeah, I mean, they're the exact same. They're indistinguishable from the ads that, that got people arrested as promoting prostitution. And um, they had actually been doing this undercover since like 2006. They had been, because this board has been around since 2002 or three. They had been undercover in some degree, like following this board and things. They had been, um, they arranged at least like two dozen meetings with undercover cops and these Korean women. And and that's the other thing, right? So, you know, they're saying these women were being trafficked. They were being held there in, in sex slavery. And for over six months, they had known they were there and had gone there multiple times to visit them and had, you know, undercover cops pretend to be clients. They say that then they left and made excuses before any activity happened. Who knows? But, um, they, but I mean, but it's, yeah, it's so, a little bit shady. I'm, right. Like, it's like if you really if you there. really believe that these people were like, you know, in, in grave danger or being like horribly harmed, you wouldn't just be like, OK, but cool. We're going to take another six months to build a case against 12 men who wrote reviews for them. Because they knew from the beginning the two men who owned the apartments. They, they had their information from the very beginning of the um, investigation. Something I wondered about as I was reading the story because the setup as it actually occurred as opposed to sensationalized headlines was relatively indistinguishable from say what happens in Nevada brothels all the time yeah. that you know these women come in and they they work and then they leave and and there are lots of people who are opposed to that but we don't we don't discuss it as this grand sex trafficking ring and I wonder how much of it is just that these women were korean that they were foreign and so it it played into like you know the for, they if they came here it must have been because they were shipped over in the way that we often talk about people being shipped over and then how much of it plays into our kind of odd ideas about women from that part of the world and their agency or lack of it. Um, is there is there a sense that that was part of the story? Oh, definitely, definitely. And they, um, the man who ran the board, um, he went by uh, the name, the, the pseudonym Tahoe Ted. Uh, he actually... You know, because they'd been undercover for years investigating them, and they they'd, they'd have these meetups between area sex workers and uh, and people who were you know frequent reviewers and contributors on the board, and it included you know all sorts of 
all sorts of white sex workers, all sorts of sex workers of all races, and and also the the Korean sex workers from that you know worked in these places, and they, there are also some Thai sort of uh, agencies that are the same in the area, um, and so they in in these undercover conversations with Ted, they had him saying that he thought that they were getting too many Asian girls advertising, Asian women advertising on the thing, and he didn't want it, not because he thought they were being trafficked. He specifically said he knew they weren't being trafficked, but it attracted law enforcement attention, especially the feds, because they wanted to, they always thought that Asian women were being trafficked. So that was like years ago, but that he had said like 2009 or something. But yeah, I mean, so that was definitely, I think, an element of it is that they... So yeah. what we have is, uh, by all by all appearances, we have... Uh, probably fairly middle-aged men who don't usually frequent, probably don't, I'm, I'm just guessing, but don't prefer their prostitution by picking up on the street, right. uh, which is dangerous for the women and sometimes the Johns too. Uh, they prefer they prefer to go to, onto a board to protect themselves and maybe even to protect the women involved yeah uh, I mean they had, they, they said the very they were involved. very respectful I mean as I said again there was definitely like some lewdness but when it came to like talking about I don't know what the women did or, or boundaries and consent and things like that they were very respectful so um yeah I mean they, they a lot of them considered themselves they called it hobbyists is what the, is they prefer to be called not Johns or whatever um, is hobbyists and they 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 had you know very ongoing years-long relationships with some women that they were regular clients of and then they also like to go and visit these new Korean agencies that were in town and right I mean it's but they they paid for sex and they were very respectful and upfront about it and they just wanted a place to be able to sort of do that. And it does benefit both them and the women. I mean, like I said before, this is one of the safest ways. You get to screen your clients. You get to set your own standards of how much you screen them. You have an email trail of them. So if anything does go wrong, heaven forbid, there is like, you know, a paper record of text messages and stuff like that. You have security at these apartment buildings. It's just like all these layers of things that actually do help keep people safe. And Seattle has a huge problem with uh, sex workers being murdered when they're picked up on the streets too. I mean, that's like where the Green River Killer is, but there's been many more than that. They have this huge problem with that, and that's the kind of thing that they're, you know, encouraging happening by by ruining things like this that do help keep people safe. Well, that's a, that's a, there's a, some line which I'm paraphrasing in your article that says now by cracking down on this activity the most legally safe way of being a prostitute or a John, but being a prostitute yeah. is the most unsafe way of doing it. Right, right. Which is, which is right. really kind of perverse. And I mean, that brings up this question of if this is how we're prosecuting sex trafficking much of the time, uh, we might be making prostitution itself more dangerous. Yeah, I think. I mean, we're definitely because you have you have clients, too, who are not going to be willing to, to do these things. They're not going to be willing to give their real names. They're not going to be willing to give references or use their real phone numbers or anything that it could identify them because now they're going to be, you know, charged as sex traffickers. So um, you have them unwilling to take these things that do keep the women safe. And just to just to conclude this sort of story, um, the, the women, they just talk to and then let go. And I, you know, talked to him months later and I said, what happened? They're like, oh, I don't know. We didn't keep track. And and in the one level, that's good because a lot of times in what they would have done was maybe arrest them for prostitution or arrest them and hold them in order to coerce them again into testifying. But they said they gave them all the option to testify and no one wanted to testify. Um, if you look on some of the boards, you know, some of their names and are being used in, in their pictures and are like showing up on boards back in L.A. So by all intents, like they just – let them go back, right back to this life they say it was so terrible, but they got all these arrests and they got all these assets from these arrests and they got all this publicity from all these arrests. I, it, so the, I think there's there's this attitude um, because we we desperately we as a society and the cops and the people who oppose this desperately want to strip these women of agency, want yeah. it to be you know that they're forced into it, and it seems like it's part of there's this broader attitude that, you know, so I wouldn't want to do job X um, and I can't imagine doing job X. And so therefore, anyone who does job right. X must be doing it against their will. And so you see this in in prostitution, but you can see it in, you know, it, it shows up in people arguing about against sweatshops in other countries or hell, it even shows up in like- Uber you know, drivers. Uber drivers or 
stay at home mom. Yeah. It, you know, that the only reason they would do that is because their husband is, you know, patriarchy and all of that sort of stuff that we just can't. It's like we, we lack enough empathy to understand the choices of others and so therefore deprive them of agency. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. In your interviews with – because you did – did you interview some of the cops and lawyers involved with this on mm-hmm. the government side? Yeah. Did anyone seem to, what, I mean, realize what – that they were doing – maybe they didn't know when they went in but said, you know, this wasn't the worst thing. Did anyone express remorse? Because also well, – No, and that's to- what's so interesting is I talked to um, Val Ritchie who is a, is a King County prosecutor and he was sort of the one spearheading a lot of this and it, who spearheads a lot of sort of similar efforts in, in that area. And, you know, I asked him about why these people who had been described as these huge traffickers got off with, you know, permitting and promoting prostitution and he said, well, you know – if we had discovered that there was something like force or fraud or anything like that being used, but uh, we discovered it was more that they provided a place where prostitution happened, and he said things directly like that, but then still clung to the idea that what they had done was important and right, and it's like, it's it's just, I don't know. And there's a tragic part to this, so too. So it was, I mean, they did, if you talk to them, they, it, and the thing is, that's if you read the police reports, I mean, if you read the police reports themselves in the court documents, you can see that, yes, they don't actually think that what was Violence being had is, is, was yeah. happening was being was happening. But they also still think that they did the right thing because no one could choose. That's what they say. No one, you know, exactly what you were just saying, sort of, you know, no one would have choose, chose this life. And, you know, he, you know, it, it's fine. Maybe it wasn't like they were, they were being held there in force, but, you know, they did work long days and, and it wasn't, you know, he said, like, it wasn't any picnic or something like that. And it's like, well, okay. I mean, a lot of, a lot of jobs aren't any picnic. It doesn't mean that we conduct huge years long stings and arrest dozens of people and justly and things like that in order to stop them from existing and then don't even help the people in any way. I mean, what are the, those jobs should exist. Great. What are they supposed to do now if they're here in the country illegally? And now, I mean, just it's it's crazy. So then given all that and given how much of your career has been reporting on these issues and how many people you know within um, sex work, can you maybe correct some of our misperceptions? Like why do – if they're not if they're not forced into it, um, they're not enslaved into it, why do women who go into sex work choose to do it? I mean, I think for all a host of reasons, for for so many different reasons. Um, from you know the, that some just really do want to do it and like to do it to to you know the people who have no other options. Obviously, there's a huge spectrum. When we talk about the people like uh, a lot of these Asian women who come from Korea or uh, China or anywhere and and you know work in these agencies for a short time, as I said, you know it's a way where they can come over and make way more money than they maybe would back home without the stigma that would maybe come from someone discovering them doing it back home. They can say they're here doing a internship or school or whatever. Um, How much money were the women in this particular, in the Seattle case, making? So the $300 an hour was generally the, the standard. And the people who had the apartment kept a hundred, I and mean, that was for the apartment and you know the the food and the everything there and the advertising and the screening the clients and everything. So, and then they took a hundred dollars, and the the women would keep two hundred, and that was generally the arrangement. I've had a couple friends of I brought this story up to a few friends of mine who are of more of the feminist vein who say that the problem here is that. The patriarchy basically teaches these women that this is an okay way of making a living, uh, that it's not really volitional, uh, that they um, – the problem here is we have to, we have to st- make it – the demand side has to be considered unacceptable, that, the, that men thinking it's okay to purchase sex is just an example of objectifying women and the patriarchy. And so we need to shame that kind of demand side like we've shamed, I don't know, smokers or other types of, of yeah. things that used to be pretty common uh, in order to fight the the problem with sex work. So this is one reason why they would say we can let the women go because they are victims and they're victims of the demand side, uh, which is part which is part of just the patriarchy. How how would you respond to that? Kind I of mean, argument? yeah, that's a, that's a huge strain of things. There's a the, uh, there's obviously a lot of divides within feminism. Um, there's a group called that usually consider themselves called radical feminists, and they are very opposed to sex work. And they and especially in Europe and places like that, um, in the Scandinavian countries, it's very popular to criminalize the purchasing of sex, but not the selling of sex theoretically. But you see in those countries that 
the ways in which you can do set which you can do sex work are very very prescribed and limited so you can't do it with one or more or two or more people in a place you can't do it with a person making the appointments for you because they'll be criminalized as a pimp still or a trafficker or whatever you know your clients are going to be criminalized so the p- cops are still tailing you and still doing this and and the, the clients still don't want to be giving you the real number or actually letting you screen them because they're worried about getting arrested so it just recreates all the same harms i mean you might yes you might have nominally less women being arrested directly for selling sex, but you still see them even arrested for other things then so that they can get them to testify against people. You still see them falling prey to all the sort of same sort of harms that criminalization of prostitution more generally brings where they're less safe and they are not able to do to do this in a way that is... So I think when people talk about that, it's like, I don't know, I just don't have patience for arguments that are theoretical at the expense of like actual people and what's actually happening to people because these, these people who say this will say, you know, we want to help women and and it's like, OK, but you cannot have – your way of helping women cannot in actuality harm them and harm underage people and make life worse for them. Like if that's your manner of helping women, it's just – I don't know. So I have no patience if, for that so, argument. So this is like even if you uh, think that prostitution is – an extreme moral harm, and and if more of that moral right. harm is on the man is on the male side for for wanting it, since that doesn't seem likely to go away, given the world's old, oldest profession, right? Like you should not make it incredibly dangerous and and even more harmful yeah. to women. They actually did a big study in Ireland where this where this was the law and and or was about to become the law, and they were you know they have clients and said. Will the, this criminalization of clients of sex work right not things make you less likely to do this, do this, do this? And it, it made very few people say they were less likely to purchase sex. It did make them say they were less likely to do things like give their real names or go to a whatever, you know, do these various things that, that make it safer. So, you, the, You've written about, about the moral panic and in one of your articles you wrote about how it's like the war on drugs and and – I th- in the beginning of that one, you know, we, we recovered from this war on drugs. We're like, well, some of us have recovered where we say, wow, we're just kicking people's doors and we're doing all this crazy stuff based on panics. Is that something that you're concerned with now with oh, sex trafficking? Yeah, because, I mean, like you see even at – at these, this is a sort of wonky example, but like with uh, mandatory minimums, and you see this huge push now in so many quarters to end mandatory minimum sentencing and um, for sentencing reform in general, except when it comes to sex crimes. Uh, Rand Paul, who's like one of the you know biggest advocates against mandatory minimums, and said you know says he'll never vote for mandatory minimums. He voted for the 2015 Justice for Victims of, of Trafficking Act, which added a 10-year mandatory minimum for people who advertise. Sex trafficking, which is really meant to go after sites like Backpage or Craigslist and things like that. And he voted for that law and only one person voted against it. And it was not Rand Paul, even though he says he's a big advocate. And that's that's just one small example. But I think you see that sort of across the board where there are all these ways that we've learned, not just libertarians, but a lot of people have learned, you know, about – how this is not going to help, even if even if the thing is ultimately bad, even if you ultimately think that drugs are bad and people shouldn't do them, the way that we have been going about it with this extreme criminal justice approach and not a more holistic approach has been like really detrimental. No one is applying that same sort of lesson here because, I mean, obviously sex trafficking is bad. I do not think prostitution between consenting adults is bad. But even if you do think that is bad, just going after it with this full, crazy criminal justice approach that that prioritizes getting more people behind bars for longer instead of sort of the underlying causes and, and problems is, is not going to help. So this panic seems relatively new. I mean, I, the, the sex trafficking – we weren't talking about this as much five, ten years ago. Is there a reason for that? Has there been a uptick in the amount of trafficking that might have caused this? No, not at all. If actually, if if anything, the government has uh, lessened its its estimates of trafficking. They're still very inflated, but it's lessened them by like tens of thousands over the past decade and a half with no explanation. People have tried to get... Worldwide numbers? or No, uh, United States. And people have tried to get them to be like, hey, how come there was 80% less trafficking in this one than five years ago? And just like nothing. Because the, the, they, there was actually a GAO, the Government Accountability Office report, on some of the early trafficking data that the Department of Justice and various people disseminated. And um, 
they concluded that it was not reliable. It was I, I'm paraphrasing, but the quote was something like, because of methodological inconsistencies and the fact that it was all done by one man who did not document his work. So like that was the basis of our federal all of our federal trafficking data and knowledge for the first like five or six years that we had this new law. Um, but to back things up. In 2000, um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed, and that was the first one that set a federal crime of of trafficking in persons. Um, it wasn't like, you know, obviously states had laws against forced prostitution, compelling prostitution. We had federal laws against indentured servitude and slavery. We had the Mann Act, which prevents uh, people being transported across state lines for immoral purposes, which is still very much used by the FBI today. But um, but so in 2000, this law, you know, first introduced the federal crime of, of human trafficking, of labor trafficking and sex trafficking. So that's when really all this started. It's been reauthorized every few years since then. And with every authorization, there has been a lot more grant money for both nonprofits and uh, law enforcement. There's been a lot more task forces. There's been a lot more federal agencies expanded or given little wings or positions that are going to coordinate and look into various facets of human trafficking. So it's just become this huge sort of like thing where there are so many people now dependent on all of this money coming in for trafficking that it just keeps growing. And I think that that is really the sort of underlying root of it. And then, um, you know, when those people go to the media, I mean, obviously, stories like this are very salient and very, you know, people want to write, reporters want to write about them. So it's it's spread like wildfire. But um, that's really been, yeah, in the past, you know, uh, since the late, since 2010 or so, maybe. How, how can we then, I guess, rhetorically or strategically uh, move things in a better direction with this, especially given that, I mean, America is a profoundly puritanical mm -hmm. society both on the the right and to an extraordinary degree on the left yeah um, and and that just the very act of talking about this stuff or I mean you recently there's like basically what amounted to a hit piece written about you and the Federalist I yeah. think it was that you know that the very fact that you're discussing the numbers you're looking into the you know the the way that the data was gathered what the crimes actually look like like makes you this evil person who condones the enslavement of children. Like how do we – given that strong cultural bias against even examining this stuff closely, how do we start pushing back against the overcriminalization and the runaway prosecution? Yeah. OK. So two things. First of all, I think you know, a lot of people in this country, as puritanical as we are, are not – necessarily against legalizing or decriminalizing prostitution between consenting adults. I mean, they were showing that in polls. It's changed now more. It's trended down again recently, I think, because of a lot of this conflation. But in the 90s and early 2000s, it was pretty – majorities of Americans, I think, supported decriminalization of prostitution, which is why you started to see, I think, some of these anti-prostitution activists really – I mean, there's actually documents from some of these groups back then that were saying, like, we need to start framing this as sex trafficking so that we can – get people to be against it. Um, I think that has happened a lot. So I think one thing is always to make sure to distinguish between, you know, things, but just distinguish what we're talking about when we talk about sex trafficking and prostitution and sex work and things. But um, from a rhetorical standpoint, I think that it's important to emphasize that you have the same goals as people, that you are also interested in, you know, in helping victims of sexual exploitation and that that is, you know, among the foremost of, of like your goals. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in helping adult sex workers and, and their clients and not be persecuted by the state. But I'm also very interested in helping women and children or people of, of any gender who are being, you know, who are in prostitution and don't want to be or in the sex trade and don't want to be. And I think it's important to emphasize that. And when you have these activists who say like, well, you know, talking about the numbers at all is who cares, you know, or whatever, or, well, so what if this operation doesn't get as many people as they say it did? At least it's raising awareness and stuff. And I think you need to bring it back to the fact that they are actually the ones that are then hurting victims with this strategy because we don't have endless money and resources and attention and law enforcement capabilities to fight this. And we are using what what limited, you know, if the problem is really as big as they say and as urgent as they say, and we have so few resources as they say, 
and we are using them to arrest adult sex workers. We are using them to spend years investigating people who post prostitution ads online. Um, the FBI does this huge annual thing called Operation Cross Country, which might actually just our most our April issue of Reason. I had a cover story about that, and um, it's supposed to be a big, you know, underage sex trafficking saving victims of it. And they ended up maybe arresting five people on federal charges. Only two of them had to do with underage people, and both of them had just been driving them. And uh, and in the meantime, they arrest like hundreds and hundreds of adult sex workers, and then they arrest hundreds of men on solicitation charges and things like that. And they're they're spending so much time and money that that they're saying is going to victims by doing this. And so when you're defending these sort of inflated numbers and the moral panic they cause, and when you're defending this sort of, well, at least if it's doing something, it's going to help, like you are taking away from the things that really would help victims. And what, what they really need is better, you know, better social services, more places, um, Sorry, so just to bring this back to you asked before about who, who people are who are in prostitution, who victims are. The federal government does actually have a lot of good data on this. They just don't like to publicize it. And when you look at the people that are in that are under 18 that are involved in prostitution, a huge number of them have been in child protective services. Um, a lot of them are runaways. There's a disproportionate amount of, of black and LGBT youth and people of youth of color and just low income family dysfunctions. A lot of them have had abuse in their past or neglect. Um, a lot of them have drug habits. But there was this DOJ report from last year, and it said that sex trafficking trafficking or or whatever, you know, their involvement in the sex trade, it just said was the least or one of the least of their problems is what they did all these. They did um, interviews with like three different agencies that work exclusively with underage sex trafficking victims, the Salvation Army and two others. And I mean, that's what they said. Like these people needed places to stay. And often they couldn't get into shelters because if you had a criminal record, you couldn't get into a shelter. And a lot of them had criminal records because they'd been arrested for prostitution in order to save them from it before. Um, a lot of them were returned to child protective services, even if they'd run away three and four times. Who knows what was happening? But, you know, a lot of them reported abuse from the people that they were living with. So this method of just like taking them, giving them, putting them in jail, then sending them back to where they're come is not helping. But we're spending all of our money and time giving cops more money to do that instead of giving money to things that could actually like give them material resources and help them get out of these situations. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.